Hello everyone, okay, I hope we're all well and happy. Okay, this lesson which I'm going to record is going to be on destalinization. Okay, now we've already mentioned this when we were discussing the rise of Khrushchev, so some of this should be quite familiar to you. And um, the PowerPoint I'm going to go through links into this particular um, page in your work booklet on destalinization. That which I'm going to go through to begin with. Okay, so I'll just bring up the PowerPoint and I will quickly go through it. So the process of destalinization then obviously began from the death of Stalin. Uh, the first thing to realize is why might Stalin's successors have been reluctant to destalinize? Why might they have been a little wee bit kind of afraid to do so? Uh, firstly, you've got to remember that they owed their positions and their power to Stalin. Uh, obviously, now Stalin was dead, um, he couldn't do much to continue their positions of power. But also, though, his model of governance as well, you know, the way that he ran the Soviet Union, the way that he ran the show, the way he caused that fear. And also, of course, many of Stalin's key people were actually in government below the top people. And a lot of the key communists, you know, within the different regions were also Stalinist themselves. Uh, many of the collective leaders following the death of Stalin, of course, had just as much blood on their hands as Stalin did. Yes, you could blame it all on Stalin, but actually not many of these people actually had opposed what Stalin did. Uh, many of them, therefore, did have blood on their hands, so they were implicated in his repression, etc., etc., there's also, of course, this fear they had about how would the public react, you know, they just had this great big thing, Stalin, this great god, you know, has his kind of almost been seen, that big cult of personality, all those pictures and paintings of Stalin, you know, how would the public react if they suddenly begin to criticise Stalin? Would that undermine kind of the support for the Soviet Union amongst ordinary people? And, of course, how would the party react? As I said before, all the key positions of the Communist Party were filled with Stalin's yes-men. Um, how would they react if suddenly uh, the leadership began to denounce Stalin? Would they say, well, actually, yeah, we actually have always agreed with this. We always thought Stalin was a bit of a monster. Or would they be shocked and horrified um, by the attempts to remove him, and which then might destabilise the Communist Party itself? And the other crucial question... And again, this really goes right to the very end of the Soviet Union. President Gorbachev in the 1980s had this same problem. How do you reform the Soviet Union without actually killing it? How do you, how do you have the surgery to remove the bad bits and make bits work better without killing the patient? And as I was saying, this is a problem really which bedeviled the Soviet Union. And, you know, at the very end, when Gorbachev in the 1980s tried to make reforms to the Soviet Union with Glasnost and Perestroika, uh, you could arguably say that those reforms actually killed the patient. So anyone going back in the 1950s, you know, how do we reform the system without killing it? What a crucial question, which really goes throughout the Soviet Union. So these people have already met and we already know. Um, so I'll just quickly go over them about these key people in Stalin's government. Obviously, we had Beria, uh, you've all found things out about, head of the secret police. Um, he actually becomes head of the Ministry of the Secret Police following the death of Stalin. May potentially have lots of juicy details and evidence to use against oppo opponents. He was the most, ironically in many ways, he was seen as Lenin's closest, sorry, Stalin's closest yes man. But actually, he was the most radical de-Stalinizer of all of them. He sought to relax the hold of the Soviet Union over Eastern Europe. He wanted radical agricultural reforms to be placed. He actually said that nuclear war would be a devastation for all mankind. He was then later changed it to just saying um, it would be, be devastating for capitalist countries. But he was the most radical de-Stalinizer out of all of them. As we know, though, he was feared by the rest of the collective leadership because of, he was head of the secret police. And as we know, he was arrested in June 1953 and then shot at Christmas, which kind of put pay to him. Other key people who we've already met is Malenkov, uh, been involved in the purges, that should say of 1933, I think, to 39, a member of the Politburo since 1946, implicated as well in the doctor's plot of Stalin in the 1940s, 
probably the most powerful politician after Stalin. Uh, when Stalin was too ill to speak at the 19th Party Congress in 1952, uh, Malenkov uh, deputised for him. He became chair of the Council of Ministers upon Stalin's death. The Council of Ministers was essentially the most powerful kind of uh, government institution um, in Stalin's time, apart from Stalin himself. Uh, Khrushchev, who we know, okay, became the first secretary of the party following Stalin's death, not considered important. Um, he'd only been on the presidium for 12 months um, before Stalin died. Uh, before that, he was head of the Communist Party in the Ukraine. So again, he's not seen as a particularly important figure. Now, in 1953, uh, what did the CPSU, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, do regarding de-Stalinization? Well, first of all, in July, uh, a report is written to the Central Committee which admitted that the Soviet Union was in a mess economically. This is what leads to the downfall of Malenkov. They blamed it all on Beria, okay? Notice how they're reluctant to blame Stalin. They thought it's easier to blame it's all on Beria and not on Stalin himself. Both of them were dead, so both of them were quite convenient scapegoats, but they clearly decided to blame it all on Beria. It was a bit ludicrous, really. He's only head of the secret police. It reminds you of it, doesn't it, of those people in those various rebellions against the Tudors, how they always blamed it on uh, the ministers, think about the pilgrimage of grace, it's all Cromwell's fault, you know, not actually Henry VIII himself. Again, it's a similar type of thing they were doing here. Consequences, uh, they broke up and replaced the NVD, the secret police, and they replaced it with the KGB, and they made sure that the KGB would never again, with the secret police, be under the control of one man and basically be alone to itself. It would always be under the control of the party itself, which is what the KGB was. Uh, they also began to release several thousand prisoners from the gulags as well. Again, they were able to say this was uh, these excesses had been done by Beria. It wasn't Stalin's fault. Stalin didn't really know about them. Uh, that was kind of the excuse they made to try and release some prisoners from the gulags. In 1955, they went a little bit further. They decided uh, to get um, the party historian, a man called Pospilov, to write a report on the abuses of power by Stalin. Now, they were being quite tentative here because uh, Pospilov was a real fan of Stalin, really admired Stalin. So anything he wrote about the abuses was going to be quite limited and kind of quite mild. So, the, 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 again, you can see how making a tentative step towards criticising Stalin, but doing it in the most mild way and finding someone who would do it in, in such a way. He was given very strict guidelines as well. He was not allowed to criticise the purges against opponents of Stalin. So you couldn't kind of say, well, these are political opponents who Stalin shot. Actually, they were innocent. He could not criticise collectivization as well. So he was quite limited in the guidelines that he had to criticise Stalin. I'm not quite sure what he probably said, you know. Stalin didn't like, you know, wore horrible coloured shoes on a Tuesday or something. They're quite mild criticisms. Don't use that example next time, I just made it up. Uh, the consequences were that even this very modest report didn't, could not conceal some of the actions of Stalin. And you could read between the lines uh, of some of the things he said to suggest that Stalin uh, could actually be criticised. And this report was released before the 20th Party Congress in February 1956. And so in that conference early on, they began to discuss some of the things which um, Posilov had kind of um, suggested. Now, the secret speech I'm going to go through in a couple of moments, or in the next video in fact, so we'll just ignore that for the time being. 1961, Khrushchev, you know, safely in power and all the rest of it, uh, decided to de-Stalinize um, even more. This photograph shows the tomb of Lenin. Uh, you see Lenin in the background there. Um, Stalin as well was also in the same mausoleum as Lenin up until 1961. And there's a picture of them both together in the mausoleum. The 22nd Party Conference in 1961 saw Khrushchev go much further in his attack on Stalin and Stalinism. He blamed Stalin for the failures of the Second World War, 
you know, why did the Germans manage to get to the gates of Moscow? Why did, you know, so many people have to die in that war? Uh, what were these blunders? They were all down to Stalin. So he was able to blame Stalin for the Second World War failures. Stalin's body was removed from the mausoleum and laid to rest um, outside uh, St. Basil's, you know, outside Red Square, that kind of area. So now Lenin had the mausoleum to himself, which he still does to this very day. And Khrushchev seemed to continue to, to criticise Stalin. He may be seen as a populist measure, because at the time he did it, it was notable, this was the time when there was some hardship in the Soviet Union, because his agricultural policies seemed to be failing. Virgin land was not the great success which he hoped it was. And so he may have thought, by attacking Stalin even further, it was almost like a populist measure. You know, he's deflecting, I suppose, uh, some of the criticisms from himself onto Stalin. Well, no wonder my reforms haven't been great. You know, look what a complete shambles and mess which I kind of um, have had to inherit. The reforms he was making once well, the Communist Party itself were also unpopular and he was increasingly criticised for his foreign policy failures as well. So again, he was able to use Stalin practice to deflect it. He was also being attacked by Chairman Mao of China for his anti-Stalinism. And bear in mind that most Russians didn't really like the Chinese particularly. Again, that may have been a populist move by Stalin, you know. Well, if Mao's criticising me, I must be doing something right. That kind of attitude. So de-Stalinisation is a process which begins very slowly and kind of builds up in terms of its speed, I suppose, as time goes on. So that should help you with that first part. Um, what I'd also like to do before I do my second video is have a think about, actually, did Kutter really believe in this or was it just a tool for him to maintain power? There has been some debates around this about whether Kutter really did believe in desonization or he just used it to maintain power. So have a think about that because, again, that could well be an interpretation, couldn't it? And the final thing I'd like to do on this, well, not the final thing, the next thing I'd like to do is there is... Um, oh no, it's not in this bit, it's on the next video. Okay, so you do that, I'm now going to do the next video where we actually talk about the speech which Khrushchev made and we'll have a look at some of the reactions um, to it. Okay, so I will see and speak to you all in the near future.